Hi, I'm Charlene Jorgensen and welcome to Quilting from the Heartland. Today I'm going to show you an old traditional block called the churn dash. This is a great block for beginners to put together. When researching this design, I found that the churn dash was many different blocks and let's first take a look at the two on the back wall. The first one that you're looking at is an uneven nine patch. It is the dark part of the block that gives you the design which gave it the name churn dash and it is the medium value in the block that is there for the accent and then the yellow background which in this case is the light value is just there for contrast and does serve the purpose as the background. Each of these blocks are sitting on point in the quilt and notice that there's a continuous line quilting design separating each of the churn dash blocks. The colors used in this quilt are very bright and playful, which makes it a very nice quilt for a child's room. And the size of this quilt would be great for a baby quilt. The frame on this quilt uh, has two borders. The inside border was cut about an inch and a half wide. It's a nice separation between the red. It separates the main part of the quilt and it announces that it's finished. And then the outside frame was cut about six and a half inches, so it's a six inch finished block. The border in this quilt just has a meandering on it. And also I'd like to mention that the churn dash block itself was just quilted in the ditch around each of the pieces. Now when you look at the next block, they are also uneven nine patches, but there is a nine patch sitting in the center of each block on point. That is the difference between these two quilts. It is the only difference. We use the same fabric, so it would be easy for you to identify the difference between the two. Again, it is the dark fabric that gives you the churn dash design, the medium fabric, which in this case is the red for contrast, and then of course the yellow is the background fabric. The quilt is the same size and also using the same fabrics. Like I said, we found many different blocks in the churn, churn dash family. And let's go back up here on the flannel board, and this is the one that we found in the first quilt that we were looking at. And this one was the second one. And see, here is an even nine patch sitting within the block, and this one just has the churn dash out in here. So you have those two options. Well, now let's go a little farther and look at some of the other fun blocks that we found when we were looking. This also is called a churn dash, but it is an even nine patch block, which just means you have nine equal combination of pieces sewing together, and this one was the uneven nine patch. This one is also called the churn dash, but it uses just two fabrics to create the churn dash design. Actually, we have a medium and a light, and here we had a light, medium, and a dark. The next one, and the reason I have name tags on was because I couldn't remember all of them. This one is also called churn dash or Sherman's March. And I thought that was kind of interesting. They just set a dark block in the center of that one. The next one, was called also the churn dash. And I'm going to take up a little more space to lay out this because look at what happens when you make many of that same block. You end up with secondary designs. Here is the first one. You end up with a square sitting on point with this variation. If you want to create a star, with this design. Then let's put, let's see, how did we do this? We had like this, and this, and this. And what we've done here is just put a blue block as the alternating block, and then we ended up with a star design when we combined that combination. The next one was also fun. I don't know what we would call it, but what we have here are strips of sashing separating each of the blocks. 
This is what they call setting the blocks. After you have them made, the, the quilting term is called setting the blocks. And look at this unusual design. We're going to use a cornerstone between the sashing, which in this case is the yellow, and then we have this design. Very different to look at. I like it a lot. Actually, these are, uh, they look like thimbles, the dark part of the, not thimbles, but spools of thread, excuse me. So that's another option that you have with this uh, churn dash design. Another name for this particular block is also called the dragon's head. And it's just where you put the color in the block also that gives it the different names. Then we went into some more books. Actually, we were looking in a book. It's a dictionary or encyclopedia of quilt blocks. This is also called the churn dash, and I thought it was a pinwheel design. But this is also called the churn dash block. And you can do it in a bigger size, also with the same pattern shapes, and those would also be another option. Again, you could separate these with solid fabrics if you chose to do that and you have another idea. Lots of fun to play with. So after you get your blocks done, take time to play with them and see what you can do. Sometimes I take a finished block into the bathroom where I have bifolding uh, mirrors and when you set the block up against the mirrors, it multiplies four times. And that's a good way to see if you want to multiply the block or add something else to it. Now let's take a look at some other blocks. Uh, we've been talking about the light, medium, and dark values of the fabric and how hard it is to sometimes see the design. Now I'm, so, I'm going to gradually move into different color combinations. Now here we have two fabrics that almost read as if they're a medium and it's a little bit harder to see the churn dash design. Here's an, a better example. See how these two fabrics are medium and we're starting to lose the churn dash. And here's the best example of bad that we could come up with. We've lost our churn dash block. All of the fabrics have the same background and we have a lot of mediums going on there. And here is another, this is I guess the example that we showed you of the nine patch in the center of the block. When making this quilt, we use the quilter starter kit for our pattern shapes and these are the only shapes that you need to work with. You have two squares, two half squares, and a rectangle in the set. And like all the other patterns, I put little fabric grips on the back side to keep them from sliding when I'm cutting. Before I start cutting the fabric, I want you to take a closer look at the collection of fabric in this quilt. Benertex sent me this fabric and it's called Day of the Week fabric and it brought back so many childhood memories for me when working with this fabric. When I was growing up on Monday it was always wash day and Tuesday was ironing. Wednesday we would go visiting and Thursday probably sewing. Friday was baking and Saturday cleaning and then of course Sunday was church. And that is what we have in the fabric and if you look closely you'll see that we have a cleaning day, we have ironing day and visiting day and all of that. So for me this was a fun group of fabric to work with. I don't think I mentioned that I decided I needed a solid to break up the blocks and I thought the red would be better than the blue or the yellow in this case. Ahead of time, I have washed all the fabric, dried it in the dryer, and if you are a beginner, like a lot of you are just now getting interested, it's a good idea to start your fabric before you start cutting. I have folded the fabric in half and matched up the selvage edges down here, and we have three layers of different prints, so when I'm done cutting, we'll have actually six fab, uh, pieces each time when we're done cutting. I like to work uh, with this ruler because it has both the yellow and the dark lines, and when you look at the yellow fabric, you can see the black lines on the ruler, and when I lift up the fabric and show you 
the dark fabric, then the yellow lines will show up so nicely. Line up the edge of the ruler with the edge uh, or the salvage edge and we'll cut all of the strips, straighten them all at one time using the rotary cutter. And make sure that you close your blade before you turn the board. We'll move that out of the way. And this time we're going to cut half square triangles. And in this design we had light and dark in all of the triangles. Now to save time you cut uh, the triangles that you need of both colors at one time. Let's see, got to line up the straightened edge of the fabric with the correct lines on the ruler. Then after we're done cutting the strips, I like to move up onto a small mat board. And if you're working with light fabric, you might want to work on a darker side of the board. First of all, we have to straighten this edge. I like to use my pointer finger up on top of the cutter like this. I feel that I have more control and when I make my first cut I always go backwards then start in a little ways and go forward. We now have six half triangles that we needed for the design. And it's the outside of the block that has the dark half square triangles. And this is the wash day fabric. Whoops, we had a Sunday fabric in there. And Wednesday, which was the visiting day fabric. That completes all the layout because ahead of time I had cut all the pieces. Now when you continue cutting the pieces, you would just lay your template up on top and continue working your way across the board until you've used up the whole strip. I think I'm done cutting at the cutting table and now we'll take you to the sewing machine and show you how to put the blocks together. I like to work on a flannel board because it's so easy to transport the pieces from the cutting board to the sewing machine. The first thing we have to do, of course, is pass a sewing test. And to do that, I'm going to take two little squares, sew them together, and I'll use cotton thread uh, for all of my sewing. And I always mention that you need to sew with a scant quarter inch seam allowance to make up for the amount of fabric used in the seam line. I like to start working on an anchor cloth. That way, I can just butt up the next piece as if I've been chain sewing. Also, the beginning stitches on the patchwork then will be as strong as the middle stitches. And before you start chain sewing, it's a good idea to make sure that you have passed that sewing test. So we'll see how it goes before we continue on. Take the time to finger press the seam open and that's what we'll be doing in this project today is pressing all of the seams open. Take the time to just press it a little bit and it looks like we have a match so now we can continue to sew. Okay, what I would do then is chain sew all of these units together first. That saves a lot of time as well as thread. We'll chain sew all the pieces together. I 
I like to work with this foot because I can get right up to the needle with the stiletto if I have to. There isn't a bridge across it, so I have an unobstructed view. I'm going to continue now to chain sew the half square triangles together. And remember that we're dealing with bias edges on this block, so if you feel that you want to pin, then probably take the time to do that. And I like to pin at this angle rather than uh, going perpendicular to the bias edge. I just like to do it that way. I don't have any real good reason. I just, it's more comfortable for me to do it that way. Now when sewing the bias edges together, uh, don't stretch the fabric. Just let it relax when it's going through. Rather guide it with a sharp, sharp object, and I'm using in this case a stiletto to do that. Now if you're making a whole quilt, you just chain sew all of the units together. And we'll do one more. Sometimes another trick too that's kind of nice to know, if you're not pinning and you iron the two pieces of fabric together before you sew, it does create a temporary bond and the fabric won't slip as much. Whoops, until you disturb them. Okay. Okay, now when we open up the half square triangles, before we press the seam open, I like to trim off the corners, which we call ears, so that we have a 90 degree corner. Now when I finger press that seam open, I don't have to do any more trimming. It's all ready to go. Again, scratch that fabric so that it lays the fabric down real nicely and do that on both sides. Let's put it up on the top and let's start putting these units together to create this row. Now when doing this, you'll just put this right sides together and continue to chain sew those pieces together. Now after this seam is sewn, I want to show you how this intersection should look. When you look up here on the flannel board, you'll see that when these two units are sewn together, that up in here, the intersection is one quarter of an inch from the edge of the fabric. And that's how they all should look. Okay, we'll connect this unit right here. That way we don't have to break our thread. I don't use a lot of pins when I sew. I sometimes find it, it takes a lot of extra time to use them. And the more practice you get, the less you'll have to use them. Okay, let's see if our intersection is right. Yes, it is. It's a fourth of an inch from the edge. And then I won't take the time to trim the ears, but understand that you trim this again at a 90 degree corner and then continue to add that on. Let's go up to this unit up in here now that's in progress. After you have the top and bottom uh, alike or like one another, then it's time to match or sew these two together. Now to match the center seams, which we want to make sure we have perfect points, insert that pin right on the seam line through the top and bottom and then put another pin on both sides. 
of the standing pin. And then pull out the center pin and insert one more. This is a nice way uh, to get perfect corners. Now I want to to remind you that it does take more time to press the seams open and try both techniques. If you like to press them one way, that's fine. Um, I just happen to like the end results. Now, when pinning the corner, I like to go just like I did when I was doing the triangles at an angle like that. And I'll do the same thing on the other end. Insert the pin so it's going at the same angle as the bias edge. Sew a couple of stitches, pull out the pin, control the fabric with the stiletto and continue on. And I can tell something's wrong underneath so I lift it up and smooth it out with a stiletto. It's kind of nice to work on a design where you don't have to concentrate so much on the process and when you make um, many blocks alike you can get familiar with what you're doing and do a good job at it. Learn it well before you go on to more complicated designs. If you're teaching a beginner to sew allow them to choose the fabric. That way they're going to be more excited about the, prog uh, the project and they'll be more apt to finish it as well. They'll let them be involved from the very beginning when they start making a quilt. Okay, let's take a look at what we've done. Okay, there's our perfect intersections that we were trying to match in the beginning. Now I'm not going to continue to finish that piece, but you would sew the uh, other part of the block on and then you will be done with one complete block. Now let's take a look at the flannel board behind us. And we have started putting the rows together and this is called a diagonal set. It's called a diagonal set because we have the rows sitting in the the pattern diagonally. We have separated each of the squares with a square the same size as the churn dash block and then along the outside edge we have cut quarter square triangles and the bias edge is in here and up in here and the straight of grain is at the top. The reason we do that is so that the quilt will lay nice and flat and be straight in the end. And then on the outside corners we have half square triangles and you want to have the straight of grain again along the outside edge. Now when starting to put these rows together what we will do is match up the seams like this. And now when I turn it over I'm reminded that when we sewed the blocks, the churn dash blocks to the alternating block we've done a different pressing technique and the reason that we have pressed them in one direction is so that we don't have the bulk to deal with that we would have the other way. So sometimes when creating a quilt you want to do both pressing techniques within one pattern. And when sewing this seam now, these seam allowances will butt up to each other real nicely uh, giving us perfect intersections. So we'll pin these and we'll be ready to sew. It's not necessary to probably put uh, many pins along there. And if you're not sure about 
hitting the intersections uh, perfectly, you might want to do what we call partial seams. And I'll show you here in just a couple of seconds what I mean by partial seams. If you are doing partial seams in this case, you would sew from here to here with the patchwork on top. That way you would know exactly where those intersections are that you wanted to sew over. And then you would flip it over and do a partial seam with this block on top, again exposing these intersections up here and working your way across. And if you're confident and think you can hit each one perfectly, then of course you can just sew all the way across. To end the quilt, I like to use a low loft batting because I like the way it drapes and it's easy to hand quilt.